Who is this guy? He sounds, he sounds great. Uh, hi, so I'm, I'm Donald Taylor, and I've... Uh, let me just quickly give you some background to myself, um, because you're going to have to listen to me for the next three hours, and you want to know if it's worthwhile or not. Um, and it may not be. No, i am spent my life in training, in learning, and in technology. So I, I left high school, and I became a computer programmer, uh, then went to university, I left university, well, I graduated from university, and I became a trainer. And since then, I've been doing those two things. And I left high school in 1981, it doesn't seem possible, working on Dell PDP-11s, which I, I, blank faces around the room. But Dell PDP-11 is like a fridge freezer machine, and it has less power than I have now in my, in my phone. And I, I took my children to a... Um, to the Museum of Computing in the UK, which is at Bletchley Park. And my father was in, in the Navy in the war, and he was a, a radio operator. And we, we, we found one place. Oh, look, you see that Morse key? Your grandfather, your grandfather used that on boats during the war. And I, you know, you know, dad in the museum. Oh, look at this, look at this. Look at, and I turned around the corner. Uh, and children, this is a PDP-11, and this is what I used to work on when I started work myself. My own life was in a museum. So that's, <laughs> that's how long I've been in this business for. So since I started as a trainer and, I've, and as a, a programmer, I've set companies up, I've sold them, I've done a lot of stuff, always in this field, and now I'm doing these things. So I'm chairing the conference here, also chairing in, in Singapore, chairing in London, helping with um, the French event, uh, and so on. Also, I've got a book out, uh, just come out, Learning Technologies in the Workplace, which um, came out in May. And I've got an honorary doctorate from Middlesex University in London for my work in learning technologies and, and learning and development. So, you know, I keep doing this stuff, and I keep doing it because I think it's interesting and it's valuable. And I think probably everyone in the room feels the same way. And I'm, what I want to do today is to have a conversation about so our lives and how they are in learning and how they've changed. It's not just me starting with that ancient machine getting to today. Going forward, things have changed as well. And they, they, it seems things are very busy. And I want to do, what I want to do is understand, have things changed fundamentally? Are there some things which are the same? What's going to happen and what do we need to get ready for the future? All of that in one morning, goodness me. So we're going to be very busy. Um, by the way, I always say it's a presentation, but it's a conversation as well. So I'm going to be asking lots of questions. I've got one slide deck. If we then get through that one, I've got a whole bunch of handouts. We're going to be doing some work together. If we finish that, then I've got another slide deck, which is questions for you. It's just questions, right? So don't worry. We're going to keep you very busy. But the conversation doesn't finish at 1 o'clock. I'm Donald H. Taylor on everything. I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, as that. Please get in touch and stay in touch. I don't know the answer. If you've got a problem, I don't know what the answer is, but almost certainly I know somebody who does. It's my job to know people. So please link in and say, Donald, you said something about, I don't know, gamification, mobile, video, new tools, this, that. Well, I don't know, but talk to so-and-so. They've done something. And maybe I can find somebody, and you can put you together and get something useful. Right, so that's enough about me. Uh, so I've been doing this for a long time. I think I've made that point. Can I just see who in the room is actually, would you say, is in, would you say you're in learning and development? Just put your hand up if you're in learning and development. Yeah? That's just about everybody. Fantastic. Good. Okay. You're in the right place, people. Great. Okay. If you've been in this field for one to five years, one to five years, could you put your hand up, please? Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Bringing your enthusiasm and energy to it. Good. Six to 15 years, okay? And if you've been in it for more than 15 years, can you put your hands up, please? Great. Okay, guys, look, for us, we're just getting our hands up in the air sometimes. That's, that's a success sometimes, especially in the morning. So thank you, everybody, for, for coming along. We're going to share conversations together. I love the layout, Jackson, as well. We're going to have lots of conversation. First thing I'm going to do is pass it over to you. I'd like you to answer a question for me. I'd like to... Turn around to the people on your table. One person, two people, I don't mind. Talk in twos and threes. And this is the question. What's changed in your work 
In the last five years, what's changed? What's new? Okay, go ahead. That's the question. It's over to you. <laughs>
Okay. What I love about learning and development people is that you ask a question and you ask people to start talking and they don't stop. It's great. Everyone's, everyone's sharing. They're all talking, having nice conversations. I don't think I've ever had so people talk quite so much, though. I think this is, I've done this in Australia. I've done it in Israel. I've done it in America. These guys are just... I, I can go. I can leave now. I better, I better stop. Okay, thanks very much, guys. That's great. Guys, thank you very much. Look, I love it. I love it. Everyone's, everyone's sharing their thinking. We're all learning from each other. That's brilliant. And, of course, I'm going to ask you now for your feedback to this question. And everyone's got some great ideas. Who wants to share something? <laughs> Always happens. Go on. There must be some great thinking out there. What, you, were, you were here. You were talking. You were having a great conversation. What were you saying? Was it just about the traffic and how bad the traffic is? <laughs> Right. Right. Yes. Right. A lot of sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and probably you were having a, a, a mutual session of how terrible it is, because in, in banking it is really difficult. In, 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 you're trying to introduce digital learning into, into the world of banking anywhere it's high security, and of course there are problems, so particularly with mobile. It, it, there's a real security issue. So that's one thing that's changed. In the past, there was no problem, because you did everything in the classroom. So security was not an issue. As soon as you try to put it digitally, it's, it's an issue. Anything else? Anything else that's changed? Is it all the same as it was five years ago? No, so what's different? Uh, the, way learn. the way they learn. Yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay. So, what were you, what were you saying? Interactive, bite-sized, video, and you, you less text. Less text. And, and yeah, you're, you're, yeah, more visual. More visual. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. So basically, we've got to we could make it shorter, make it more interactive, more visual, and so on. There may be very good reasons for that. We'll have, we'll have a look at why that might be in a, in a minute. Actually, there may be very good reasons for that. Actually, I think everybody. Everybody benefits from learning in that way. It's just that millennials may have not learned to stop themselves wanting that. They've just, they're allowed to do it. I think everyone learns well that way. Of course, it can also be that they can learn in other ways as well. I still believe the best, the best value you get in learning is a book. I would say that because I've just written a book and I want you to buy it. But apart from that, apart from that, I really think pound for pound, the best value you get is a book because there's so much information in there. But... You're on the move, whatever, yes. There's lots of reasons for doing it in other ways. Right, okay, there's loads of people around that table. You must have one great thing. Yes? Yes. And we did, I was, I was at these guys yesterday, and we were doing some video. Honestly, I thought... And it was, it was for a campaign. It was for a campaign for the, for the conference. And I thought, I'm going to turn up and there'll be a camera and I'll speak into the camera. And it was a green room, right? With a green backdrop and with software, they can put everything onto it. And you've got a, a wireless mic. And it's, it is like being in a TV studio. It's extraordinary. And this is stuff that is just being used now to generate material for learning from. Absolutely. And it's not just sophisticated stuff like that. With these things now, we can do it ourselves, can't we? we do, there's a lot of that going on. We'll talk about that later on as well. Video. Anything else that's changed? From that table, then I'll come to this table here, then we'll get cracking. Anything else? Video is obviously one. Anything else? We were saying the rate of change. The rate of change? The rate of change. Just, just Seems to be faster? Yes, it does. It does. It, well, it, it must have been nice. I mean, my, my father's generation, we were very hardworking, okay, went to university, and he, he was the first of his family to go to, to university, and he worked very hard, and he got another degree, and 
it, it's not true to say he could then stop, because he kept learning, but the pace wasn't the same. But now, it seems that you've just got to pick up on stuff. And we'll talk about the pace as well in a second. That is really true. I've left you to last. You know I'm coming to the table. What's the big thinking from this table here? Nobody's looking at me. Nobody's mentioned the reduction in classroom time yet. You're absolutely right. But of course, everyone in this room, we're all in learning, right? Everyone's got, let me just check, you've all got big budgets, all the time you want, uh, and there's no pressure. Is that right, guys? Yeah? Yeah, so that, that low chuckle. No, you're right. Of course, yeah, they want more for less time, and particularly lower, less classroom time. Absolutely. Why is that? Why do, why do they want less classroom time? It's not that they're against the classroom. It's time consuming. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime, anywhere, anyhow. So the, the people want to learn from themselves fast, and there's this time practicality. And I heard the word cost over here as well. It's definitely cheaper, but also it's, this, it's the time thing is really big. After all, one of the big problems with the classroom, and I. I used to run a training centre in London, a very big training centre, like, well, not as nice as this one, this is a lovely training centre, but like this one. And the business of scheduling is such a headache. And if you want to learn something, you have to wait until the class is scheduled. People don't want to wait. People very often can't wait because of the time. Okay, so, security is an issue. Millennials, small chunks, video, pictures. Video, again. Time pressure. Time pressure, classroom. These are some of the changes, and I think you've got the most important changes there. All right. I'm going to suggest what we're going to talk about for the next, um, I don't know, hour and a bit. I want to talk about this business of change in more detail. I want to look at our minds, and particularly I want to look at how much of this change is new, and how much is, are our minds always the same as they've always been. I will explain what this strange building is. I will look at adapting and what we need to do to change. And then I'm going to ask you to do some work uh, when we look at L&D in practice. And I'll give you some, some tools and tips, some thinking about what we can do. All right. What's this? Anybody know? It's books, yeah. They, they seem to be the wrong way around. Books and paper clips. They're not paper clips. They're chains. Say again. Yeah, well, Alexandria Library burnt down just before the birth of Christ, didn't it? But you're absolutely right. This is a library, a chain library. In fact, this is the library of the school that I went to, my high school, Guildford Grammar School. Why are the books chained up? But I'm sorry, we had another library as well, which was a proper library with modern books in it. But this was the ancient chained library. And the reason why the books are chained up is that the, the school was founded in 1502. Right, so it's a very old school. And in the, then, that was just 50 years after publishing and printing, books were ultra, ultra valuable. One of these things was, was worth at least, I don't know, the cost of a car, probably more. And so you couldn't let people walk away with them. They had to be chained up. Knowledge and information was so valuable, it was chained to the wall. That's my chained library at my school. About, about 1510 it was set up. So we, had, we actually had a copy of like, books by Newton in here, and th they were chained to the wall. That's how information used to be. Now, of course, we have this. We take a picture, and this is uh, the Oscars, I think it's 2014, and Ellen DeGeneres takes a picture, and it goes round the world. It's retweeted 1.7 million times in less than an hour. And of course, I'm sure it's been broken since by Beyonce or somebody. But it, this is, we've changed, changed from a world where information was so rare and so valuable, it was locked up to where it just is almost frictionless and flies around. And where you can access almost the sum total of human information from a computer that you carry in your hand, in your pocket, and you just use your thumb like this, and you've got access, effectively, to the Library of Alexandria. In your hand, and we don't bat an eyelid about it. It's extraordinary. Can you imagine what the Greeks and Alexandria would have thought if they... No, they wouldn't be able to imagine it. They, they would think it was a gift from the gods or something. 
where has all this come from? And, and what, what effect is it having on us? That's one big change. Information has gone from being rare to being almost frictionless and free. That's one big change. Another big change is that people are much more valuable to organizations than they used to be. And your point that people are moving from the classroom into trying to learn on the job, at work, faster for themselves, is partly because people are much more important to organizations. And there's one way of looking at it, which is this work by Ocean Tomo. They, they, um, they look at the intangible value of organizations. What that means is, in any organization, you've got tangible assets, the computers, the tables, the buildings. And you've got intangible assets, the brand value, the people, the know-how. Now, when I was at primary school, primary school? Yes, when I was at, no, when I just started my high school, that, that school with the Change Library, in 1975, about 17% of an organization's value was intangible. So most of the value of an organization, there's probably someone trying to teach a class next door. Uh, anyway, most of it was in the solid stuff you could touch. Now, it's entirely flipped over. It's gone from 80-20 to 20-80. Most of the value of an organization today is the intangible. That's the stuff in people's heads. That's where the value is for an organization. So we're shifting towards the knowledge economy. And the result of this is twofold. Firstly, we have this information flying around. Secondly, we've got people and information being more valuable to organizations. And the result is that things are picked up and it's faster. Because as things move around, information changing hands is much easier to change hands than tangible assets. The result is this. Sorry, I should explain. This is my first car. <laughs> my first car was a Hillman Hunter. You won't know what a Hillman Hunter is. It was a very unexciting car. But it was mine. That job I had, being a computer programmer, I worked and I bought this car. Well, actually, it was second or third hand. And I have to say, it rusted all around here. And it rusted here, and it was a pretty awful car, but it was my car. In those days, when you were making a car, it's well, from the start, and you know, you know what it was like then. It was, let's think about an idea. We'll make it, and they used to make it in, in clay first, and, and they would do the testing, and then they would make it. The whole process was about six to eight years. And that carried on until about 2008. In 2008, the processes, the information, technology, and everything began shrinking production cycles. Now, rather than it taking about 60 to 72 months to start to go from the idea to the production of a car, it takes about two years, maybe three years, probably about two years now. What that means is that the production cycles are shrinking. Now, so what? Well, what that means is that for all of us in our jobs, everything is happening faster. Now, the knock-on effect of that is, when I started training in the 19, and I started training in the 1980s as an English language teacher, life was very easy. English language doesn't change. And by the way, in the 1980s, there's no web. You are the king of the classroom. Everybody has to come to you. Even later, 10 years later in the 1990s, when I was teaching Excel, Excel version 3, by the way, when I was teaching Excel, if somebody wanted to know the if function, they didn't go to YouTube. There was no YouTube. They had to come to you. They had to wait. And they'd say, when can we know? I'd say, 2.30, 2 2.30 2 this afternoon, we'll do the if function. And, you get to, and they have to wait for you. It's not like that anymore. Now they learn it by themselves. Curse them. But they do, and it's good. They can find it for themselves. That business of writing the courses to deliver in the classroom is a process and it takes time. And it takes a long time to write a course. A long time to write a course, you deliver it. The people have to wait to come on the course. We don't have the luxury of time anymore. If it takes, if the, if the production cycle for a car has shrunk like that, we can't continue with the, way, the old way of doing it, which is let's write a course and then deliver a course. Because by the time the course comes out, very often, things have changed. And that's the reality which we live in. And I, I, I was talking to Charles Jennings. You know, you know Charles Jennings of 70, 20, 10 the other day? And he was saying that at Reuters, very often, he used to be the chief learning officer for Thomson Reuters, very often they would produce stuff very quickly, knowing that within three months it was gone. 
So they weren't writing courses like my English language courses that would last forever. They would write it, throw it away, write it, throw it away. It was a very different process. So just to wrap up here, we've got people being more valuable, information flying around, and as you said, John Paul, things happening much faster. All right. What's our reaction to that? Well, actually, this is, a, this is from Charles Jennings. There's a great quote here from the Corporate Executive Board, um, some research. Organizations, to reach their goals, they're saying, need to do about 27% more. They need more, about 27% more percent out of their employees, on average, across all these organizations. And the problem is that work is more complex and interconnected than ever before. We know this. We know that typically, in the last five years, the number of people that you contact in the course of your daily work has increased by about 50%, just to do your job. So it's more complex and interconnected than ever before. So it's not about doing things the same old way. It's about doing things differently. We can't keep doing things the same way. So this, this idea that everything is changing is true. But when we say that, what's the reaction of most organizations? Most organizations are still actually, oh, sorry, by the way, everyone, lots of people are taking photographs of this. Jackson, will we be able to get the PDF out to everybody? Yeah, OK. So, Please do take notes. Please do take photographs. That's absolutely fine. And we'll get you the PDF of the slides as well. So don't worry if you think you've missed something. But taking notes, all the research shows, by the way, particularly handwriting notes, is a very good way of um, fixing something in your memory. Anyway, so our reaction, though, in most organizations is still to deliver a very formal sort of classroom training. And where does that come from? The drive to deliver classroom training comes from this. I've been talking about my family history a lot. This isn't my primary school, but it, it, <laughs> but it could have been. It could, this is actually a museum, but it could have been my primary school. I went to a school that was exactly, oh, that's good, yeah. I went to a school which was exactly like that. I sat in a chair like that, at a desk like that, and it had a lid, and my books went inside, and that was at primary school and, indeed, at secondary school. How do we know this is not my classroom? Because I've shown you my car. I've shown you lots of things. Why is this not my classroom from my childhood? Who's that there? It's not Albert Einstein. It's Queen Victoria. <laughs> because we always, you know, we used to be, you always have the queen in your, in your classroom. So... This, this, is, this is from a museum in the UK where they take buildings and they put the buildings up of what life used to be like. Everyone who comes into this room says, oh, yeah, that, my school used to be like that. And it, it, it's 150 years old, and it hasn't changed. Now, the impact of this is pretty interesting. We take people from the ages of 5 to, let's say, 18. We put them in a room like this. Everybody's the same. It doesn't matter how color you are, what religion you are, what background you are, what gender you are, we all do the same thing. Everyone goes through this process, and at the end, then, they go into the workplace. At work, what happens is people expect that if they're going to learn something, they're going to do something like this. And when it comes to trying to get people to change their minds about learning and to do digital learning in some way, we're generally fighting against a tacit assumption right in the back of people's minds that this is what learning looks like. I think things are changing. I mean, we talked here about the millennials and people want to do things fast. I got, I got in the lift today at the hotel. The guy got in, didn't say anything to me. Got in like this. And got out the next floor. That was a bit rude, but that's just his life. That's his life. He gets on. He was watching, he was watching a Chinese cookery show. I don't know why. <laughs> But that's his thing. And he was probably learning something. Okay? And that's life. So things are changing a bit. But still, a lot of the assumption is, yep, it's got to look like that. OK. I'm going to, I think, so what I've done there is I've looked at change, right? Where the change comes from. We've discussed the change. You know, that's my old library. Obviously, I had a very strange childhood. Um, I'm going to move on to these other bits here. And then at some point, we're going to ask another question. Actually, you know, when one of these slides comes up, that the next slide is always going to be a question. And here it is. So are our minds different today from in the past? And this is coming back to the point that was raised here about millennials. And I don't think we've got a definite answer about this. A lot of people say our minds are changing. 
Well, I'd like to discuss it. I'm going to hand it over to you. I'd like you to discuss this on your table. Do you think our minds today are different from how they were in the past? If so, how are they different? Please go ahead. Do we have a, um, a plan for coffee break any time? Yes. What time? Or is it not? Oh, definitely, definitely 10.30 if possible. We'll get through today. Because I think if we've got, we're going to go through to, I think, 12 to 12.30. I think, yeah. We're going through, to, I'm just talking about to me about the coffee break. So if we're going to say, have one about 10.30, mm -hmm. would that be okay? Yeah. So one and a half hours, 15, and then that's low 10, 11. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go through to 12, about 12.30. Yeah, I'll drop the DSP. Yeah, okay. Okay. And maybe maybe another one if we need one. Okay. <laughs> 
for people because you know people people are doing quite a lot of thinking and talking so it's always good to give people a break we might if we have one at 10 30 we have a chance to do another one at 11 30 if we want to that's the point i'm thinking okay great it's good actually i mean for them to have a more conversation yeah yeah it's nice. yeah it's good it's good yeah engaging yeah 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 well they're i know yeah it's good we've got, got bright people together they always um they always have good stuff to talk about yeah the best thing is today all are learning yeah it's a really good really good group of people yeah. they are doing the targeted yeah 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 so yeah. yeah we have all the good people and they are doing it's good good yeah. nice no, good bunch yeah. good bunch of people so i join you later i got a con call so sure, sure 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 Okay. okay. I'm just, I'm just keep, keep looking like you're working. I'm going to take a photograph of you like you're working, okay? You have to. Go on. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you very much. Okay. I've, I've, I've phrased this question very carefully, and I've, I've used the word mind deliberately. There, there are two things we could talk about. There's mind and brain. Um, okay, that's a... Yeah, that's a brain. I, it, I, I'm not an artist, okay? Uh, and then inside there, we don't know where it is exactly. You've got your mind, right? Your mind is what is in there, and the brain is the physical thing. I'm, a, I'm just saying this because uh, in the course of our conversation, we may need to remind ourselves, are we talking about the brain or the mind? And in a minute, I'm going to talk a little bit about the brain. Okay, but the question is the mind. So, what's the answer? Are our minds different today from in the past? Now, the past is open. It could be yesterday. It could be 10 years ago. It could be 10,000 years ago. I haven't said anything, so it's open to you what you think. So, guys, what do you think? Are our minds different? What do you think? You just think about it for a moment there. I'll walk over it. These guys were talking a lot. Okay, what do you think? Are, are they different? Are, are different? Right, I'm going to come back to you. So when I come back, I want a really strong answer. Right, come on. Are we different? <laughs> I like this. It's, this poor gentleman here, everyone else is pointing at him. Okay, it's your turn to... Okay, over to you. Oh, mine is thinking towards this area. <laughs> Okay. This is really this is a really good point actually. And a lot of people and we'll talk about this in a second. A lot of people are saying we don't need to remember anything anymore. We've got Google, we can just put stuff online, we don't need to remember anything. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Okay? For some things it's true. I don't know any phone numbers. Anymore. I used to. I can remember the phone number from my childhood, 01483 573 5135. But I can't remember my wife's phone number. I've been married to her for. Hmm? Or even yours. No, I do know mine. I know mine <laughs> because I, I know most people don't. But when my kids were growing up, I, I, I just would <laughs> tell them every day, okay, my phone number is this. So if there's a problem, you can always get me on the mobile. So because I was repeating it, I remembered it myself. So there we are. Uh, but it's, it's a good point. If I ask my son what's your phone number, he hasn't got a clue. No, there we are. So, and that's partly because, of course, he keeps losing his phone and he gets a new number all the time. Um, so, the question is, it, it, 
are our minds changing? You're saying basically, probably not, but we're changing the way we're using our brain, which I think is a really sophisticated answer. And I have to say, I don't know the answer to this question, but we're going to have a discussion around it, and I think it's very important to think about it. And there is no right or wrong answer here, probably. So I think that's a good answer. Anything else? Any, any other thoughts here? No? Yeah, I'm going to come back to you guys in a second. Are you ready? Are you ready? You want to talk to somebody else first, or can I come to you? Yeah, okay. Uh, not having to think of, uh, remember anything. So, oh, I need to know about this. This is good. I need this is good. Yeah, yeah. And then when you talk about Googling something, actually, it's a very good point that, of course, when you Google, you get a lot of answers, don't you? And so you have to use the critical thinking that you're talking about to make a decision, don't you? So your mind, you're using your mind to decide which of these answers are you going to go with. And it's usually not a good idea to go with the first one. It might be, but usually you want to have a look and, and choose which one you're going to go with. So you're, we're using our mind, but in a different way. In the middle here, what, what thoughts do we have? Are, are our minds different? Are we learning differently as a result? So far, we've had people saying, no, we're more or less the same. What do you think? Go on. So because we've got these tools, we're not using it effectively. Tell me more. And I tend to agree with you, but tell me more. And in the minds, we're doing a number of things all the time. But yes, we are making this change from simply searching and taking for granted what we might have been taught in the past. And after all, what we were taught in the past could easily be wrong, but we didn't know because the person in charge of the classroom would tell you and you had no way of checking it. Uh, so we have to, we're changing our, our way of thinking. Okay, from this table here, anything? And then I'm going to move on with, what, with some, some thoughts about the brain. Any, any thoughts? It's all been covered. <laughs> With three answers, we've covered the whole of the human mind. That's fantastic. You've got a very bright bunch of people. They couldn't make their, they couldn't make their minds up. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't, by the way, you don't have to wait for me to ask. If I'm talking, you say, Donald, I disagree. Please feel free to say, no, I, we disagree. Or, on our table, we said this or that. Okay, I'm going to carry on. I don't know if our minds are different or not from the past. I don't think our brains are very different, and that's an important thing. So I'm going to talk a bit about our brains and the basic stru not structure, the basic way our, 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 our minds work and what's important to it. And I, I just want to, to, to look at some of the things which we, or one thing in particular, which we don't do very often when we are trying to get people to learn. And that will lead us into this business of how we, are, should, be, how we should be adapting what we do in learning and development. So if you remember, we've looked at change, and we've agreed there's a lot of change going on. I want to look at how, do, how does our mind and our brains work? Then we're going to look at adapting what we do. So I wanted to set ourselves up for this bit here. How should we be working? Because we tend to think we should be doing a digital version of this. But actually, that's not effective. And so what I want to do is get to the question of, if, that, if we're not doing that, what should we be doing? All right, minds, brains. Steven Pinker, See, he's an incredibly bright guy. He writes fantastic books. He is also rich from his books, and he's also pretty handsome, and basically, you know, what did I do wrong in my life? This guy seems to have done it all. He's got this great quote here. For most of our lives, most of our history as human beings, 
we weren't like this in cities. We were in the countryside, existing on a campaign, on a camping trip that never ends. We were out there every morning, waking up, wondering if a tiger was going to eat us. So when we're thinking about our brain, we need to be thinking not about all the stuff that surrounds us that keeps us so busy all the time, but about how our minds, how our brains were formed during most of our evolutionary history, which is all about how do we survive. Our minds and our brains today are pretty much as they were about 200,000 years ago. There isn't much change to the actual structure of the brain. This is a spear. This is actually a spear from South Africa. But you can find spears uh, actually in South Africa now which tell us a lot about how we, our minds worked in the past. It's very difficult. Right? You, you can find a skeleton and you can learn from the skeleton whether somebody had arthritis, how tall they were, was it male or female, but you can't tell much about the human mind or the human brain from it because there's no fossil. But from the artifacts that are left behind, you can tell things. And we found spears with shafts and with bindings that tell us an extraordinary story about the human mind. About 190,000 years ago in South Africa, there was left behind a, a spear shaft, the wooden bit, and the stone bit that goes on the end. But to attach the stone bit to the wooden bit was a very sophisticated process. Firstly, the wood had to be heated up. Then it was left. Then they got glue. But they had to make the glue by taking something from a tree and heating it and leaving it. Then they added some stone, and then they put it on the wood, and then they put the stone on it, they wrapped it up, they heated it, they left it for a process of several... The whole process takes several days. This is not something you do by mistake. It's something you do by thinking about it very carefully. It's what's called sophisticated thinking. That sophisticated thinking is exactly the thinking you do today when you're lying in bed in the morning, you think, right, OK, I'm going to get up, I've got to do breakfast, take the kids to school, da 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 and just planning. And that planning is something we've always had in our minds. What we didn't have, of course, then was a sophisticated city around us. We only had our, ourselves on the savannah. But we do know then that our brains have supported sophisticated thinking for pretty much throughout evolutionary history. And that's pretty important because it's what makes us different. Here we've got um, Homo sapiens skull, we've got a Homo heidelbergensis skull, and we've got my daughter. And my daughter is the one on the right. <laughs> now, we've all, got, we've all got skulls like this. This is the Natural History Museum in, in London. Every, just about every half-term break, I go to this museum with my daughter. We have a little routine. She's 15 now, and I say to her, Eva, you're 15. Do you really want to go to the Natural History Museum with your dad? And they don't know if he's listening to music or something. Now, come on, dad, let's go. We always do the same thing. We go in, we get there early, we see the dinosaurs, then we see the skulls, then we go to an exhibition, then we have lunch, we have a nice chat. She loves it, it's a little ritual. So this is her looking at Homo heidelbergensis. We are still here with our skulls. Homo heidelbergensis died out. So did the Neanderthals. So did the Denisovans. So did every other two-legged, hominid form apart from us. Why did we survive and the others not? And the answer is, is what we had up here. It's our brains, our minds. We survived because we were able to anticipate what was happening, to have that sophisticated thinking, and to share it with our colleagues. There's two things there. It's the thinking and the learning and the sharing. Those two things made us the dominant species on the planet. Homo, Homo heidelbergensis died out. The Neanderthals died out in Europe most likely because they weren't able to adapt to the changing climate. And we could. The biggest weapon for us wasn't a stone axe in spreading ourselves around the world. It was a needle and thread. 
So with needle and thread, we were able to make clothes. No other species made this, and so on and so on. Uh, imagine imagine you, this is, for most of our lives, that was a big threat for us, right? So our biggest survival tools are not our axes, but our learning and communication. That's what I'm trying to say here. It's the learning stuff and then sharing it across generations so we learn from each other. All right, so what I'm trying to say here is, right, we've got our brain. Our brains haven't changed very much. Our minds, uh, in fact, we know our brains haven't changed hardly at all. We know our minds have always been able to do sophisticated thinking. All right? So if you think about waking up in the morning and wondering, okay, um, is a lion going to eat me today or am I going to be able to find some food for my family? Your brain is, without you thinking about it, is already learning all the time because learning is what helps us survive. All right? Here's a list of things that I think are instinctively things that we learn from. And the, the key thing on that is threat. Nobody seems to think about this, but actually, if you want somebody to learn something, the best way to get them to learn it is to make it a matter of life or death. Now, it's a bit dramatic, and you can't do that in the classroom, really. Um, but it's what we learn from, isn't it? Right? You, you, don't, you don't touch a fire twice. Our minds, our eyes, our brains are literally wired up to pay attention to people. If you see a picture and it's got a person and a landscape, your face goes to the picture, goes to the person. It's a part of the brain called the fusiform gyrus is, is there to understand faces. And, that, and, and we react to that as babies. We react to movement, because it could be a tiger in the bushes. We react to change, because if something's unusual, that could be a threat. We react to repetition, because if the same thing happens again and again, it might be important. But also, interestingly, we, remember, we, we learn when we're trying to remember something. Now, that's a bit odd, but it's worth remembering that the actual process of trying to remember something helps us, which is why if you're writing notes for something, and then you come back and you look at your notes later on, and you can't quite make it out, the, the bit where you try to work out, what did I write there? What was he saying there? What does it mean? Actually helps you remember it and get more value from it. So, practical tip here is, this is what we pay attention to learn from. So there are things that we can do all the time in when we're trying to help people learn that will make it have more impact. So we don't have to try to kill them in the classroom, but we can make things personally relevant for them. <coughs> Stories. Faces. One of the reasons why video is so important pe for people is just that movement, our eyes are drawn to it. The guy watching the Chinese cooking show on the lift this morning, well, I, don't know, I, I, I don't know if he was even listening to it, right? But it was something moving in front of him. I think he was just drawn to it. Change, we know, we know that change is, is valuable. We know about repetition and retrieval practice. Guys, are you familiar with the idea of space learning? Is that something that's familiar? No? Yes? No? Some nods? Some shakes? All right. Uh, I'm going to write something on here. If you haven't got this, I would check out... Um, I would check out Will Falheimer. And he is, I think on Twitter, he is Will at work. I'll check that in the break. All right. Now, Dr. Will Thalheimer has done a really good paper on spaced learning, and it's all about the, the methodology and the process whereby you don't give people two hours of stuff. You give them 10 minutes, break, practice, 10 minutes, break, practice, 10 minutes. And if you're trying to learn a language, for example, spaced learning is a much better way of learning your vocabulary than trying to learn everything in one go. I used to live in Turkey. I lived in Turkey for five years in Istanbul. And when I was, when I was there, I, I taught myself Turkish pretty much by reading the newspaper. And I had a notebook, and I'd write down 15 words, and I'd learn my words. The next, and about two days later, I would learn 15 new words and the previous lot of 15 words, and the lot from seven days ago, and the lot from 14 days ago, and so on. And that simple process of repetition over time helps you learn it. And of course, retrieval, retrieval practice, the other person to follow is Dr. Jana Weinstein. 
um, Liana Weinstein, uh, who is, I think, she's got a brilliant Twitter handle, Dr. Y. Uh, so this is all, of, both these, Will is just generally about learning at work, but Yana is particularly about how the mind works for learning. And retrieval practice, she's done a lot of work of that in the classroom, and how making, making in particular, children t test themselves. It's, it doesn't sound very sophisticated, but if you make people take a test in the right way, it actually helps you learn well. So, and, and this is... This is it's just how our mind works and how it has always worked. To come back to my question, has our mind changed? It hasn't really in many ways. These things here are what has helped us survive as a species and these guys have done, uh, share good research on how it's helped us. I want to look at one particular thing, uh, just as an example of this, and I think we'll stop and have some coffee. Uh, Amir, would it be okay to have coffee in about 10 minutes? Yeah, okay. Um, so... What, I was doing a webinar, I was doing a webinar the other day and I put this picture up and I always have the chat panel running at the same time. I put this picture up and I, it was like somebody shouted in the chat, oh my, I can't, no, take it away. And I had to move on to the next slide. This person was so afraid of spiders. Phobia, phobia absolute phobia. And I used, I used to be quite sort of derisive about this. I thought, well, come on, just, just grow up. But it turns out, actually, that phobias are partly genetic and inherited, especially for, for spiders. If you've got a mum or a dad who hates spiders, it's quite likely that, you know, you will as well. And the reason is, there's a good reason for hating spiders. They might bite you. Now, we don't all hate spiders, because if we all did, we'd, nothing would get done. But if, if it, you have to have some people so that there's a sense in a group of people as a whole that spiders are quite dangerous. So that's a good reason for hating spiders. But we're all, we can all be wary of the things that are dangerous in the natural world. It might be a spider, it might be something else. If you always see a spider in the same place, then, all right, you, 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 the repetition tells you, uh, looking underneath a dark space, you may find, let's say, a spider or a snake, right? But if you see the same thing in different places, that is quite striking, and you remember it possibly more, but certainly in a different way. And I just want to introduce you to one experiment, and then we'll have a break and have some coffee. It's an experiment that people haven't used very much in learning, even though it's has quite a dramatic effect. It's called um, the environmental context effect, or the variation effect is a short way of doing it. So these people in 1978, Smith, Bjork, and Glendale, were wondering, okay, people take observation from their landscape. They learn things. Does the place in which they learn things, like if you see a spider here and a spider there in a different place, does that affect the way they learn? And so, they set up a simple experiment with a bunch of people being asked to learn a list of words. They had a messy basement office with no light, and they had a very well-lit tidy room, lots of natural light in it. The, the professor who gave the people the questions in this one was messy. He had a, a jacket that was a bit rough. He had no tie. He was wearing jeans. And this one, they had a very, a very neat professor. They had a number of groups of people. Some of the people were taught these... Every group went through two sessions. So some people had two sessions in the basement. Some people had two sessions in this room. And some people had one session in one room and another session in another room. It may be that one, then that one, and another group, that one, and that one. Okay. So, here's the question for you guys. You've got two different rooms. You've got two different study sessions. You've got a, and they were then tested on the words in a third room. And the third room was sort of halfway between. It wasn't very messy. It wasn't very neat. The professor was kind of 
in the middle, and the lighting was okay. Who do you think recalled their words better? If you had both of your sessions in one room, in this room, both of your sessions in this room, or one session in one room and one session in another room. Who did the best recall, do you think? And it was very, very significant. You think, you think two in the messy one? Okay. He might be right, he might be wrong. Anybody else think anything? No idea. And that's okay. It's okay to have no idea. I know. Because I've got my notes in front of me. I'm the teacher. <laughs> of course, if you were smart, you'd get your phone out and start Googling Smith, Bjork, and Glenn. It's quite a long thing to Google, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I, but, I, but I, don't, I, I, would, I, I work much better in that sort of room, though. I can't work, I can't work in a messy environment at all. Hmm? I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just too old school. Look, I'm wearing a suit, for goodness sake, of course. So, all right, so we've got different votes. What about one in one room and one in the other room? Yeah, I've got some nods for that. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what it was. The people, it doesn't matter which room you're in. If you're in just in one room, two sessions in that room, or two sessions in that room, then you, you, you recounted 16 words on average. But if you had that room and then that room, or that room and then that room, you remembered 24 words on average. So it's a big difference. Big difference. The context effect is that you are more alert because you're seeing things in a different way. Now, for me, I have difficulty remembering people's names. And, and that's a problem because I run conferences. I meet lots of people. And what happens is I see somebody in one room in one context, and then I see them the next year in the same room. And it's really difficult for me to remember who they are. I haven't been able to change my habits. I still don't know who they are, but at least I have a good reason for it. I now have an excuse. My excuse is the context is not changing. But if I see, if I see, somebody, if I see somebody in one room and then in a different room, particularly wearing different clothes, suddenly I can remember them. It's, I'm, I've noticed it's a really strong thing. And the reason for this is that when we see things in different contexts, we are attuned to it, and we think it must be more important because we're seeing it again. So it's an evolutionary thing. It's helped keeping us survive. So I think it's going to be a good time to get some coffee. I'm going to just wrap up where we've got to. We've talked about change. We agree there's lots of change going on in the world. We've got our millennials. Curse them. They want everything smaller, faster, video, color. Um, we can't do security. Or we can do security, but it's a nightmare in the banking industry. We've got um, video being important. Change uh, being fast, we've got time being a real consideration for people. Despite all that, and despite the fact that we are working in a very different environment, information flies around faster. Things are done under much greater pressure. Our minds probably are about the same, and there are certain things which we can predict about them. So we know that. If we see things in the same environment, it's not as gonna, we're not going to remember it as well as if we see it in two different environments and many other things. Shock, repetition, and retrieval practice being among them. All right, after break, we're going to come back. We're going to look at, all right, bearing in mind that our minds haven't probably changed very much, and we are living in a world that is changing very fast, what do we need to do to adapt to it? And then we're going to ask ourselves, right, practically speaking, we're going to talk about it in general, then practically speaking, we're going to work on what you can do in your workplaces, possibly, to go back and think about things in a slightly different way. Maybe just one thing, maybe a whole bunch of things we don't know. Good. Time for some coffee, guys. Thanks. Where, Mia, where is the coffee, by the way? Just outside. And how long do we have for it? 15 minutes? 
there is no way we can have a coffee break for, 50, for these people who's going to last 10 minutes. That's just not possible. So it's, we're gonna, I'm going to say 15 minutes, and we both know it's going to eke out beyond 15 minutes slightly. But I'm going to say half past, we're going to come back in here. Okay, guys? All right, thank you. Ah, oh, what's the correct handle? Thank you. Will work, learn. Will work, learn. And it, there's somebody else. Will it work as somebody else? Thank you. Now it's really important. Will I, 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 even as, as I wrote that down, I was thinking, doesn't sound quite right. <laughs> Trump, Trump, Trump. No, no, no. Okay. So now it, it's going to get a lot of new followers. It's going to be very surprised. <laughs> hmm? He's on my. Yes, I'm Donald H. Taylor, like I am with everything. And in fact, what we're going to do is at the end, at the end, we're going to share resources that everyone finds useful to learn from. And we'll either put on the on here, that's not very big, so we might end up with me just typing, and we'll put it on a, on a slide, and we'll just share with everybody what, what people find useful. Because when you get a big enough room together of people, there's always somebody who's read a good book or who's you know, follows somebody on Twitter or LinkedIn. The best way of doing it, actually, is to get um, is to have people write stuff and, and pin it on, a, on a, um, the wall and then share it with photographs. I'll have to see if we can do that. Oh, oh we could do that, too. Right, I'm going, to, I'm going to start, because if we don't start, nothing will happen. Okay, hello, oh, oh gosh, you see, this, it's, it's the millennial generation. We have a break. What happens? We do this, don't we? First thing. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure what I am. I'm not sure what I am. Um, I'm, a, I'm a baby boom. I'm a cusp. I'm a cusp. Well, they say the baby boomer finishes around 1962, 1963, 64. I'm 63, so I'm, I'm right at the end of the baby boomers. Hmm? I'm 1963. I'm not 60. <laughs> I, know, I know I've aged a bit recently, John, Paul, but really. I think, I'm, I think I'm the end of the baby boomers. There we go. So... Um, We've looked at this stuff. We're going to have a look at how we're going to adapt and deal with this, th the fact that we've got a new world, but our minds haven't changed very much. So what are we going to do to do it? Well, I, you know what happens. This slide comes up. The next slide is always going to be a question. And my, I, I'm going to ask you the question. But I'm focusing now on the tools. What tools can we use to adapt what we're doing now to the new world? And I'm sort of looking also for people to share what you're doing. If you're doing stuff that's really interesting... I'd like to hear about that. So we're no longer in a world where we can rely on teaching people in the classroom to be effective. OK? What can we do instead? Leverage on existing technology. Say again? Leverage on existing technology. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Rather than, rather than, I'd, I'd love to have the conversation now, but I'm going to ask everyone to chat on their, on their tables. I can then have some coffee. And when I finish my coffee, then we're going to get your feedback. All right? I'm being a bit cheeky, but I'm, I'm desperate for that caffeine. <laughs> All right, so I'll answer this in conversation, and then we'll get some feedback, okay? possible to get some flip chart paper and some yeah and some big pens and some blue tack and what I'd like to do is have have these on the tables and then have everybody writing down because when I was doing this bit people were were very keen to to, to write down the the resources and I'd like to have everyone sharing what they found useful and then then we'll, we'll pin it up on the wall there at the end would that be okay sure okay Oh, ah. well, it's a very strong, very sweet <laughs> coffee. It was exactly what I exactly exactly what I wanted. Actually, it's fine. 
Yes. Yeah. High caffeine, yes. I need to do it. Mm -hmm. No? Really? No. I, I, I haven't really been sleeping properly since I got to Singapore. So I'm living on caffeine at the moment. I can guarantee John and I are going to go to the hotel. We're going to have a shower, obviously, and we're going to get dressed. And then we'll get a taxi. And as soon as I get the taxi, I'm going to go. If you ask Sharon about yesterday, to, to, every time I got in the car, I was just falling asleep. It's terrible. terrible. I feel so rude because, you know, she's driving us around. And, and I, want to have a, I want to have a conversation, but now that's a, the sleep has really not worked out properly for me. I'll do, I'll do better next time. Not yet, not yet, not yet, no. I'm thinking, I'm just thinking ahead, we'll, we'll do it in about an hour's time probably, okay? I'm just thinking ahead, thanks. It's incredible the effect of a cup of coffee on everybody. Everyone's having a great conversation. I don't, I don't want to stop it, but I'm going to stop it anyway. So, I, I know, I know this is a great com I, It sounds good. It I'm going to give you a minute just to think about it, and the minute I'm going to come back to you, okay? You ready? Okay. Okay. Right. Over here, you, everyone was talking. It sounded great. All right, but over here, let's start in the corner. What what were you discussing? Um, what Sorry, what augmented reality. Yep. Yeah. 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 Now, does ev is everyone familiar with what augmented reality is? Yeah. I just, I don't want, I don't want to, you know, introduce a term without people knowing it, but yeah, okay, good. So basically, it's, it, you're looking at something and, okay, okay, in, uh, right, good. That's one thing, we can use that. Anything else? Yeah. It's amazing, Duolingo. Does anybody here use Duolingo? I do, yeah. You, you have to supply your own discipline, but it is very, it is very good, isn't it? Yeah. Good. Well, I'll come back to that in a second. Okay. No, these guys are, are still talking. And it, and it, <laughs> I, I, is, that, is that your family, or was it no, it's Duolingo? Duolingo. <laughs> I, and it would be, if it was your family, that'd be okay, too. I'm gonna, I'm also, I've got a screenshot of Duolingo, which I'm going to put up in a minute, so we'll, we'll, we'll share it. Okay. What, what are we talking about here? Kahoot. And, and, and can you just explain what it is to people? Right, that's great, that's great. Yeah. And there, there are lots of these tools. 
Um, and I've, I've, I do a lot of stuff face to face. I've always been quite skeptical about them, but actually now they're really good, aren't they? And you can have, you can be talking and have a have a screen behind you, and and people are doing this, and the questions are coming up. Now, not everybody feels comfortable with that. I personally, I love it. I think it's great because not everybody's happy putting their hand up and speaking, but generally people feel okay sharing stuff with text. That's great. Were you about to say something? No? It's okay. I'm not trying to go on. Right, so are you ready now? Yes. No, no, no. I was going <laughs> to... I know, I know, carry on. I know, I know, no, it's all right. I know you're already, but, I, but come on, you, you were about to say something, weren't you? I'm not trying to give you a hard time. It's okay. Future Learn. Okay, guys, does everyone know what Future Learn is? No, not really? Okay, MOOCs run by a combination of universities, started by a group of 12 universities in the UK, but now international. Yep. Um, so about why, why are you looking at me when you're saying older generations? <laughs> she did, she did. <laughs> okay, tell us about WhatsApp. <laughs> I'm 54, it's okay. <laughs> Just saying that um, they've been having a hard time um, downloading and yeah, yeah. installing yeah. it, but they don't have a problem to just open your WhatsApp and mm -hmm. read it. So if you can just share something, if there's something you want to yeah. ask, um, to me that's the best way to communicate to everyone. Everybody. Absolutely. And this business of sharing is really important. And we know that, you know, I, I said earlier that our greatest tool for survival was learning and, and communicating. Is, if you learn by yourself, that's one thing. But if you learn and you share with other people, that's much more powerful. And WhatsApp and all these tools are really great. What are, I mean, the other tools we've got, obviously Twitter, Yammer, Slack. I mean, there's a whole raft of them. And it, it, but those are the ones which you hear about being used over and over again. But, it doesn't mean they're always going to work by themselves. And there's always this problem with technology that you can put it there and nobody uses it. So, but if you've got the right culture, it can work. All right. Let me, let me just push on then with, with some thoughts about this. Um, here are some of the tools. And look, here's Duolingo. There we go. So that was me. Now, actually, I wasn't learning Spanish, but it's just, a, it's just a, one of the things they do. And what Duolingo do, which is very good, is a form of micro-learning, which I want to look at in, a, in just a moment, because I think that's something which is quite hot at the moment. A lot of people learning how to do stuff um, on YouTube just by themselves. My son plays piano really nicely from YouTube. It's, it's incredible. My daughter plays the bass from YouTube. She, she has lessons on the piano, but she plays the bass by herself. And this is guy, this guy, I can't remember his name, is Peter, I think. I met him on a train going from Boston, from New York to Boston. And he's a British documentary maker. And he's written a bunch of courses on Udemy, which are making him a lot of money. He doesn't have to do anything. They're just video courses. But because he's an expert in his field of documentary making, he's posted them up there. He puts the courses up. And that's it. He doesn't have to do anything else. He just gets a check each month. And it's quite a nice check. And we're moving, I think, to a world where in the past you just had to make do with the person you knew in your village. Now, with connectivity, you can find the expert in the world in your field. How bonkers is that? That's brilliant. This guy knows more about this than anybody else and you can reach him. So, of course, you'll pay a bit of money for it. And, of course, he's happy to collect it. He's, he's drawing on 25 years of experience. Fair enough. So, these are some of the tools, and of course we have these other tools as well, which we all use for sharing and what have you. Um, I'd, I'd like to have a quick look uh, to drill down on this business of micro-learning and repetition of learning, because I think it's, it's, it's just interesting. I'd like to explore how much, of it is, how much of it is a fad and how much of it is real. But first, if I say micro-learning, does that, does that mean anything to anybody? Yes? No? Is it something you've heard of? Yes? Okay. Um, 
I do a, a survey every year where I, I ask people internationally, what do you think is going to be hot um, in the next 12 months? I don't, I don't say, I don't ask, I don't describe what I think hot is. I just say, what's going to be hot? And I give them 15 choices. And this, uh, I asked these, these questions last, last year. Um, it was the fourth year we've done it. You choose one to three options. I got nearly 900 people voting from uh, 60 countries. Most of it is, is these regions. Where is Malaysia on here? <laughs> Guys, when I send this email out this year, I want you all to vote, okay? And tell your friends to vote, okay? We need Malaysia to be up there next year, all right? Um, interestingly, it, it's quite a good spread. When I first started doing it, it was mostly in the UK, but now it's, now it's quite well spread out. Um, so here are the, the questions that I asked people. I said, what, what will be hot um, this year? And I was asking towards the end of last year. Of those, what would you say is going to be the hot thing? If you were asked this question last December, what would you have said was going to be the hot thing this year? So we've got a vote, a vote for artificial intelligence. Anything else? Obviously, I'm going to show you the answers in a second. Gamification. Say again. VR. VR. Over, where is it? VR. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Say again. Micro learning. Social learning. Nobody has yet said what was actually number one, interestingly. We've said almost all of them, but nobody said what's actually number one. That I heard, anyway. My hearing isn't very good, so I could have missed it. <laughs> I'm going to put the answers up now. You might be surprised. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> the number one was personalization, then collaboration, microlearning three. Now, to be fair, virtual augmented reality was fourth. And it will be, I, I, when I ask the question again this year, I know it's going to be higher, that's for sure because there's been so much noise about it this year. <clears throat> MOOCs. Why are MOOCs number 16 out of 16? I don't know. I've written a whole piece about this on LinkedIn. It drives me mad. You've got fantastic free resources from international experts, and we're not interested. What's going on? Actually, I, I asked this question. I got a lot of feedback was saying this stuff. It's, you know, it's, it, the scheduling isn't very convenient for people. Very often, it's not very well aligned with work. So there are lots of reasons why people aren't using it. But it still remains the fact that it's free. And I, why wouldn't you just let people do it if they're going to find it useful? Anyway, that's my, that's my bugbear. But what I'd like to do, so anyway, please do. Uh, I'm gonna, you'll, you'll get an email from somebody, I'm sure, saying, please answer this. Remember that guy. That gave you that talk, and come and vote for him. Let's get Malaysia on the map. Um, I'd like to look at microlearning because microlearning is interesting. I put it on um, <clears throat> in 2016, the list, and it was at number five. And it's very unusual to have something jump in because these things haven't moved around very much, some of them. So to have something jump in here was, was interesting. It went up to number three this year. So there's been a lot of interest in microlearning. And what I want to do is just explore this for a moment, because I think, A, it's an interesting trend, but B, it tells us something about how we work with learning technology and think about it, which I think is important as a bigger picture. So, quick question, and we'll, let's just have a shout out. What, if I say micro-learning, what, what do you think that means? Everyone's saying bite-sized. Okay, so it's bite-sized. Anything else? Okay. It's slim. It's. It <laughs> okay. Say again. It's just in time. Now, what, what, when you say that, what do you mean? Yes. Okay. So the, the, the reason I ask that question is that with just in time, there's a sort of there's there's a potential difference between. I decide to pull it down, or it gets pushed to, to me. And so you're, you're emphasizing the pull it down bit. 
I'm choosing to find it? Yeah, okay, you're going to find it, okay. Um, but I'm going to give a definition of my own in a minute, which you may or may not disagree with. Nobody actually has a definition for what, what microlearning is, even though everybody's talking about it. Nobody's actually said what it is. Um, so my definition is that um, it is, yes, it's, it is about bite size, but it, it goes beyond that. Yes, it has to be small, but it has to be other stuff as well. For me, it has to be spaced out. So with Duolingo, you, you learn some vocabulary. And then you get tests on the vocabulary a day later and two days later. And it keeps repeating it until you've got it. The reason it does that is that it, and, and so it's spaced, it's structured, and it's relevant to the learner. You're, you're interested in it. But this business of being spaced and, and structured, it for me, is a difference with microlearning between it just being some stuff I've seen on YouTube. Because bite-sized could be anything. But if it's micro, for me, it's got a structure, and it's put, delivered in a way that helps me learn something. And I look at companies like Axonify, based out of Canada, that does a very good job with this. And they help people learn, for example, pharmaceutical sales reps understand their drugs better by hitting them with bits and bobs roughly every day, but then asking them to repeat it and repeat it like Duolingo until they've got it. And the reason why it's happening now, I think, is that it's, it's effective for the organization. It is very efficient for the learner. You get it in 10-minute bulk chunks typically and it's convenient and this line here in the background I've not just made this up that's a that's a Google Trends graph for people doing searches for micro learning in the past three years and it's just suddenly exploded up here so for me micro learning the key thing about it is it's not just a bunch of content it's content which is structured and delivered in a way to help you understand something otherwise it's just content that's okay but I think micro learning has to go a bit beyond that so here's our friend Duolingo. Um, and I talked earlier about when I was in Istanbul, and I was, I was learning Turkish, if you remember. I was talking about how I, I wrote my, my stuff. This is, this is my notebook from Istanbul. So that's what language learning looks like now. It's fantastic. You don't actually need technology for micro-learning. This is my point. You can do micro-learning yourself if you really want to. You write out bunches of phrases. And then here you've got your study progress, 1988. On this day, I'm learning page one. On this day, I'm learning page two and page one. On this day, page four and page three. All the way down to this date here, I'm learning those four pages. And by the time I've got to that page there, which is something I learned 28 days ago, I know it. So it's the same thing as Duolingo. It's just not quite as pretty. But the structure is there. That's the key thing for me. I can't believe I was that self-disciplined, honestly. <laughs> it is actually quite impressive, isn't it? <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, why, where was the interest in microlearning? This is the point I want to get to. So first, the first point about this is, look, we have a topic and there's a lot of fuss about it. Okay, good. And there's fuss for a reason. We can learn things well with microlearning, great. But there's another reason, I think, for the fuss that we have to be a bit wary about, a little bit careful about, and I'm going to explore that now. Where did the interest come from? I said that I first had it in the report for 2016, and in 2016 it was explosive. It jumped in at number five on the list. But you can see from this that of the five different regions that made up most of the votes, most of the interest was coming from North America. So in North America, over 12% of people put microlearning first. In fact, in North America, it was the top choice on the list of the whole of the continent. And that was enough to force it to the top of the list. With everybody else, it was, it was number, I don't know. Typically, those scores are enough to get it to like third place or fourth place. The next year, what happened? The next year, this happened. Wow. Everybody else is interested. Australia, New Zealand, suddenly interested. EU. Blah, blah, blah. UK jumps forward. In North America, actually, the vote drops back a bit. So what has happened? What's happened is that the fad and the interest 
came through in North America, and then it died back a bit. If we look at that on a map, we can see, and that there's a, I'll, I'll, I'm going to come to a conclusion about this in a second, which I think is rather important. If we look at that on a map, we can see that in 2016, North America made up about a third of all the votes that were going towards microlearning. A year later, we can see that it's shrunk massively. The proportion of the votes for North America has shrunk. It's almost like it's come out of North America, it's shrunk down there, it's shrunk a bit in the UK, but wow, it's spreading across the rest of the world. And actually, that is the message here. The message is that when we get big, hot stories in learning technologies, they almost always come out of the US and Canada, but typically the US, and then the rest of the world picks up on it. And in English, well, in the UK, we say, when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. It just spreads across the world. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. And the, the, the issue we've got here is we've got, effectively, the Gartner hype cycle. So what happens is, in America, somebody says microlearning is going to be important. It shoots up, and everyone gets really excited about it in the States. And while that's all happening here, we're all down here somewhere. We're not, not quite sure about it. The States comes down here, and then we get, make our way up. And it looks a bit like that at the moment, I think. So we're making our way down this side. The EU's at the top. Next year, microlearning is not going to be quite as hot as it was this year, I'm sure. It will be turn of VR in 2018. That is going to be the thing that's going to be hot. For me, the lesson out of this is we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening? And it happens because of money. The US is a big market. If you get a lot of funding for something, sorry, it's a big market. And if you set up a technology company in the US, you can sell to that market. Now, plenty of people try it, plenty of people fail. But if you are successful, you've got a market to get into, and you will get funding for it. And so what happened is, in 2016, a bunch of companies that were founded in 2011 or 2010 and had spent time building themselves up started to make good traction with good case studies, with, mo with micro-learning, and were successful and got funding. And it's getting the funding that drives the interest and the news stories and everything else. What then happens is everyone else gets pulled along, and we all follow the trail on this roller coaster. I'm not saying microlearning doesn't work. I'm not saying these companies aren't selling good products. They are. But the enthusiasm probably goes beyond what we should be thinking about. So the lesson for me from this is Remember this roller coaster. Next time somebody's talking about something and they're all excited about it, great. Maybe it's useful. Maybe it's useful. But use your head and just ask yourself, where are we here? Is VR, gamification, whatever, where are we? And how is it useful for me in my business? It's very easy to get on these trends and get taken away. I'd rather we all took a very level-headed view of it. And, well, put your, put your votes in next year. I'll send you all the survey, and we'll see if my prediction that it's going to be VR rising up next year is correct. All right. Let's press on. I, we've, we've talked a lot about memory today, because I think it's really important. And right at the beginning, I said, what's different? How have things changed? A lot of people said, we sort of talked about the idea that we don't have to remember things anymore. We have our... People talk about this being their, their external hard drive. They put some of their stuff from their head into here, and then we don't have to think anymore. What do you think? Do we need to remember things anymore? Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess it, yes, I'm not sure. What? <laughs> you know people that don't. Yeah. Alexa. Okay, so the ele now, Alexa is this thing in the corner of the room. You speak to it, and you don't have to remember anything. Seriously? Yeah. And that's a bit creepy, isn't it? Come on.
Yeah, yeah. I'm serious. I'm seriously going to get myself an Alexa. I, I am totally. But I, I am actually worried. I'm worried that I would become too dependent on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep. You could you could open the curtains as well, couldn't you? <laughs> I, I I think I. It's an issue, isn't it? But nonetheless, you are remembering some things, aren't you? To come back to this question. And we had this discussion earlier, maybe we don't have to remember things. Maybe we can use our critical faculties and we decide and we search and, and that's, that's what our brain should be used for. But are there some things that we do need to remember? Like what? You seem very certain this table here. That was, a, that was like a tidal wave. What, what do we need to remember? Oh my goodness, <laughs> you are not kidding. Now, can I just say, in my defence, because my memory isn't terribly good, it was my 20th wedding anniversary yesterday. Wow. You can all write a card to my wife, because she's in England. <laughs> no, uh, I wrote a card before I left, so I did remember it, and then I put it in a special place and made sure that my daughter made sure that she got the card. So I did, you do remember some things. That is important, isn't it? Yes. Anything else other than anniversary dates? Birthdays? <laughs> yeah, I'm rubbish at birthdays. I really am, actually. Pin numbers, car keys. Yeah. You can't, you can't ask Alexa where you put your car keys, can you? Let's be honest. <laughs> do, you know, do you know who this is? Do you know who this is? Anyone know who, who Henry Mellison is? Anybody? If you're interested in human memory, I recommend Googling him. Or you could ask Alexa. Alexa, who's Henry Mollison? And why have I done his dates in this strange way at the bottom? Henry Mollison was an American citizen, and he had a problem with epilepsy, apparently from a bike accident he had as a young man. Yeah? To try to cure his epilepsy, in 1953, he had a brain operation. And the brain operation removed two-thirds of his hippocampus. Subsequently, he no longer had epilepsy. But he couldn't form new memories. It's, not, it's actually slightly more sophisticated than that, but basically he couldn't form new memories. He could remember just about everything up to about a year before this point here. After that, if you came into the room and said, Hi, Henry, he's a very nice guy. You'd have a conversation with him. You'd go out the room. You'd come in again. Hi, Henry. He wouldn't know anything about you. Absolutely no memory of it. But he could form procedural memories. So he could learn how to walk around the block, for example, by himself. He could learn a new physical skill, but he couldn't learn new facts. And he also had some problems, actually, with, with his vocabulary as a result of this over time. What his state tells us is, is, is two things. First, there is some fascinating research about how human memory works as a result. A lot of which is that human memory is not like a computer. We don't put things into it and then we remember it. It's an iterative process. So we put things into our brain, we reform the memory. We reform it, we relive it, we reform it. Some of this happens when we're asleep. And that's where the hippocampus is, is vital. It cycles this stuff around so we're reforming our memories all the time and sometimes in fact, very often when we reform them, we don't reform them accurately. So we reinvent the past for ourselves. And that's one of the things we learn from him. The other thing we learn from him is just how important memory is. He couldn't find his car keys. He didn't know people's names. He didn't know anniversary dates or anything. He knew nothing at all. So when people say to me, 
Ah, oh, Don, we don't need to remember anything anymore. I say to them, what about Henry? What about HM? Because he was known as HM for a lot of the research. He lived for a very long time, and they couldn't refer to him by his real name. They just called him HM. What about HM? He, did, he had no memory, and he could not function as a proper adult. Of course we need memory. And we need memory not just for where we put our car keys. We need lots of reasons for it. Here's my daughter. Uh, there she is. But you recognize her now, because we've met her before. There she is playing bass in the band at the school. And um, as I say, she's learned that entirely by herself. But she, she didn't just pick it up. She can't, you can't ask Alexa, how do I do this solo? You've got to practice. You've got to practice. You've got to put the work in. So there are some things like language, like playing a musical instrument, where you just have to know things and you have to practice at it. When I get on the plane to fly to Singapore, I don't want the pilot saying, Alexa, how do I land this thing? <laughs> Can you imagine hearing that on the intercom? <sighs> There's stuff that takes practice, and there's stuff you need to know. My brother is a petrochemical engineer. If he wants to work out the flow through a refinery of petrochemicals, the cost at various points, he has to use a whole bunch of stuff that he knows. And he has to do other stuff as well, but you have to have it in your head. There's also other things the brain does as well, which relies on memory. Uh, what, what country is this the flag of? Fantastic. Wales. My wife's from Wales. So, and I'm half Scottish, so we, we cover most of the United Kingdom between us. We're very pleased. This at the top is a sign in Wales. That's, that's a sign in English at the top, and at the bottom it's in Welsh. I can't speak Welsh, but it does sound like a spell from Harry Potter when you say it. <laughs> Do you know what this says? Of course you don't. No. If anybody said they knew, I'd, I'd be amazed. Okay. That, uh, but... <laughs> well, you, you, you would expect it's a Welsh translation of this, wouldn't you? Yeah? Okay. That's what it actually says. <laughs> now, <laughs> what, what happened? Tell me, why, why has that been put on the sign? What happened? Yeah. So the guy making the sign, who's in England somewhere? He's in Coventry. Can you translate this, please? No, no entry for heavy goods vehicle. Off it goes. All right, there you go, right. Put that on the sign. That's a very expensive mistake, isn't it, really? That's what happened. It's a real mistake. And you get this all the time. I've got, I've got a whole library of these mistakes. I, I've, got a, I've got an oil tanker, and on the side it says diesel in Arabic. No, it says the, word, it says the words in English, diesel in Arabic. And <laughs> somebody has said, on the side of that, put diesel in Arabic, okay? Right. Diesel in Arabic. Now, okay, what's happened with... When we've been telling this story, what's been happening in your heads? What's happened is, you've understood a whole bunch of stuff. You know what it's like to be in an office. You know what it's like to make a mistake. You have a sense this is extremely costly and rather embarrassing for somebody. And you're able to make that jump. I didn't say what happened, you looked at it, you said, this is what happened. And you can't do that without memory. There's all those different things come together, and you make the jump yourself. So it's because of the context and this, the brain works. It's fantastic. Computers can't do this stuff, by the way. So if you're worried about your mach a machine taking your job, provided you've got some intelligent insight and context and creativity, you're safe, okay? Memory and insight is the same thing taken to the next level. Here are four people. I'm going to ask you a question. It's a bit like the Welsh question. If anybody knows the answer to it, I will... I'll give you all the money I have in my wallet, okay? 
What links these four... I've got to check how much money I've got in my wallet. <laughs> what links these four people? Yeah, true. <laughs> but it's not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later on, okay. Um, Anybody else got it? What, what links these four people? Any ideas? What, what's Archimedes famous for? Philosophy. Philosophy. What, he, did, he said something dramatic. He said Eureka, didn't he? When did, when did he say Eureka? Yeah. He was in his bathtub. He took a bath. Why? Yeah, but why? <laughs> it's true. It's all true. Well, why did he say Eureka? When he was lying in his bath, he suddenly understood something. He understood the displacement of water. You don't know probably who Augustus Kekulé is, but he's the guy who, who discovered the structure of the benzene atom, a benzene molecule. Benzene molecule is a... Yeah, the benzene ring. There you go. So a benzene ring is like this. It's... Uh, I think that's correct. I, I, I should have checked before I came out, but I'm pretty sure. Is that right? Yeah, I, I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't even drawn a benzene ring for probably 40 years. It's an unusual shape of a molecule. Nobody knew about this. Kekulé couldn't work it out. He knew all the bits that went into it. He couldn't work out what the shape of it was. One night, he went to sleep. He woke up having dreamt of a snake, and the snake was eating its own tail. Suddenly, eureka. It was a eureka moment. Watt was, you know, James Watt, the guy who invented, not didn't invent, but he, he, he made the modern steam engine, had a problem. He couldn't fix it for like six months. Walking across a, a, a green in Glasgow one day and suddenly, eureka. He, he realized the answer to the problem and he transformed the modern world. And finally, Elias Howe. What a, what a dude. Look at him. Yeah? Really? Yeah. He looks like he should be in Revenge of the Planet of the Apes, doesn't he, really? He's, um, it, it, Elias Howe invented the sewing machine. And the sewing machine is a bit peculiar because the sewing machine has a needle, but the hole for the needle is not up here, it's down here. He was trying to find a way to get a needle to go up and down, up and down, up and down, efficiently. But he couldn't do that if the hole was at the top. And he said, how do you do it? He fell asleep. He woke up. He had a nightmare. He was surrounded by natives who wanted to eat him, and they all had spears. And the spears had a hole at the end. And suddenly he thought, Eureka, that's how I'm going to make my sewing machine. So the thing that links these people is they all had Eureka moments. They all had sudden ideas. You can't have a sudden idea if you haven't got stuff in your head to put together to have an idea with in the first place. Eureka doesn't come from a, sorry, Alex. <laughs> right? It doesn't come from a computer. Machines can't have those moments of creativity, and we can. So do we need memory? I think, yes, we do. But we need, I think we discussed this earlier. We need it in a different way. We need it in a way that we control and we make use of. And I say, in order to have those Eureka moments, very often you need a really wide basis of learning and a really... A, a, as much information coming to you as possible because you don't know what's going to be useful. I think this is a very strong argument for trying to broaden our reading and broaden our education rather than be very narrow in it. So, my point about all this is that we know the world is changing and we know that we need to learn and we need to lead, learn to help, help ourselves with technology. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that memory remains very important. Let's use the brain for what it's good at, which is these things, and let's help people's creativity rather than trying to, I don't know, make people part of a machine. All right. Let's come back to this question of us in this room and what we do in our jobs. What's our role in this new world? What are we supposed to be doing? 
I've got a bunch of case studies I'm just going to take you through, which I think illustrate some of this. I think part of it is to help people be creative and so on. But I'd like to just go through these case studies, and then I'm going to ask you to do some stuff together. And we're going to, we're going to together source some good um, resources to help us do our jobs in the future. So for me, our job in this new world is to look at, look at things in a different way. And I'm going to take you through four case studies of people who I think have done that. Uh, at the end of last year, I was at Online Educa in Berlin. It's a great conference. Um, I was finishing my book, and I was a bit depressed, because in my book, I talked a lot about learning technology, but I couldn't find a good wrap-up for it. I wanted to find some stories of people who done a really good job. Luckily, I met Jeff and the woman on the next slide, Anka. Jeff had been at the conference the year before, and he'd, become, he'd come away really inspired. He decided that he had to stop trying to do the classroom model. And I say the classroom model, I don't mean literally giving lessons in the class. I mean, he, had to, he decided to stop treating learning and development as a way of pass, like a bit, parceling up information and giving it to people. So he decided to stop being a course factory. And what they did instead was they moved to being a performance-focused center. That's a big shift for a company to do. Axo Noble is a, is a pretty big chemicals company in the Netherlands. What tends to happen in learning and development is that people give us a phone call and they say, I'd like to have a course, please. And we say, yep, what do you want? Uh, and they say, well, I need a, I need a my 30 people need a one-day course on time management, for example. How do they know? How does this person phoning us know that his people need a one-day course on time management? Hmm? If you go to the doctor, if you go to the doctor, do you say, I need a course, a, a, a two-week course on amoxicillin, please? I, I want the doctor to tell me what my problem is and to help me out. Why, why do we accept the view of somebody phoning us that they know what they're talking about? And I think particularly if it's a time management course, the answer is, no, you don't need a course on time management. What you need is to be a better manager. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, don't take that literally because I'm not, not responsible for you losing your jobs. But it's absolutely the case that most people asking for courses do not know what they need. And our job is not to be a yes factory. We are not pizza people. We don't say, do you want anchovies with that? What we should be saying is, I'm going to come and talk to you about what your needs are and we'll sort it out. And when Jeff says he decided to stop being a course factory, that's what he means. Shifting towards a performance focus rather than being a fulfillment house. So that's one, I think, great case study. By the way... I, I was very sceptical that anybody could do this, but he managed to find a language for talking with the rest of his organization about this, where they understood it pretty quickly, and they took on board the idea that performance was something they had to be responsible for and having a conversation about. Sometimes the answer was a training course. Sometimes it was a PDF or a job aid or something else. So his real success was not making this decision, but in persuading the rest of the organization that they could come along with it and it was beneficial to them. And in fact now, they are very happy not taking courses but finding other ways to improve their performance. So he did a, his, real, his real success was being a change agent in his organization. Anka Iodace is, um, works for Citi, the bank based in Switzerland. They, well, I mean it's a US bank but she's based in Switzerland. They knew that they had a problem in the organization, which was like most financial institutions, in fact, most knowledge-working organizations. They had a lot of bright people who knew a lot of stuff, but they weren't sharing it. And that's a real problem in these organizations, because it's very difficult to make implicit knowledge explicit, to get stuff out of people's heads and to share it. Some people do smart stuff with getting people to sit down and tell stories into videos and they try to share the videos. But they decided that wasn't a good way of doing it. It wasn't going to be fast enough and it wasn't going to be organic enough. If we think about the Eureka moments, in banks, 
in most knowledge organisations, you need people to have a lot of stuff in their heads. They can suddenly say, ah, these things are happening and that is my answer. You're employing them because they've got smart heads, but they've got to have the information to do it. And usually the information is in other people's heads. So how do you do it? Well, their philosophy, and this, I, 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 honestly, I was interviewing her for the book on Skype. I was just chatting with her and she said this. I thought, oh, fantastic. That is the opening quote for my last chapter because this summarizes so much that we need to be doing in L&D. Anybody can help somebody get better at anything. It's not down to the learning and development department being the center of everything. How do they do it? Sorry. That, is, is there somebody on the other side of this wall? Or are, are they there? I'm not quite sure. I feel, I feel a bit guilty. I'm, I keep knocking on this wall. How do you get people to share? Well, they, if you say to people, guys, we put a social media program in place. We've got a platform, and we'd like you to use it. What happens? I know five people use it, nobody goes along, the thing dies, and I say, what happened? You have to give people a reason for doing it. They, and, and again, the, the story here is really a change story. They managed to make the change happen. They had something called Be More. The Be More program was asking people not to use the platform. Why would they do that? The question was, can you share some stuff, please? In fact, the question wasn't even that. The question was, can you take the 30-day challenge? Now, the 30-day challenge was getting people to do things slightly differently. Every day, they had to do something that took about 10 minutes. And then they had to share it on the platform. It might be, right, we want you to go and have, and it would just be delivered to your inbox or, or by text. How have you decided to get it? So a challenge comes to you. And the challenge might be, find somebody you haven't spoken to in the organization for six months and have a 10-minute conversation with them. Then let people know that you've done it on this platform. Next day, it might be, read the last page of the company report. But every day, they had a challenge which was easy to do and required them to post something on the channel about it. There's research on building new habits that suggests that it takes about 23 days to build a new habit. 23 days to 63 days. There's a, sort of, there's a, there's a window. So if you get people to take a 30-day challenge and they stick at it for 30 days, you're pretty likely to have a new habit formed. The habit wasn't opening your email and doing something and then talking about it. The habit they wanted to form was talking about it, but they needed to give people a reason to do it. Guess what? It worked. Suddenly, at the end of this process, People were using the platform. They weren't just using the platform to talk about the weather or the cats or whatever. They were using the platform to talk about stuff that was important at work and to share stuff. Now, it's impossible to give a, an ROI figure. You can't say, as a result of doing this, we have generated this amount more value for the organization. But what you can say is other stuff around it. They have tracked the engagement figures. The people who did this are more engaged with the business than they were before. They, are, they all of them, almost all of them, now have personal development plans they've set up for themselves. So there's, there's a sort of knock-on effect around it. But the key thing is, they've got people sharing. And when you get people sharing, you don't know what's going to happen, but you're going to start the eureka moments and people are going to be able to work better in the organization. So the commitment came from the top. This is worth doing. We don't need to see a, va a dollar value for it. And they managed to get people with a new habit of sharing. Brilliant. But if you're sharing stuff, is that enough? What it, how do you get an ROI value for it? This is Mike Booth at Vodafone. So I'm moving, from, I'm moving from, if you remember, we had Jeff. Jeff's big thing was, we're going to move from being a fulfillment house that takes orders and makes learning pizzas to somebody who's a performance support focus. We've got Anchor, who managed to get people using a social medium and sharing. But what if you really want to show value? Can you do it? Yes, you absolutely can if you've got the data in the background. So if the organization's set up for it, you can get the data. Mike Booth at Vodafone used a platform that enabled people to create user-generated content. If I say user-generated content, does that make sense? Yeah. In this case, the content the, user, the users are creating is video. And at Vodafone in the retail store, Vodafone is one of the UK's major phone retailers, 
you've got a store, you walk in there, you want to get a phone. Now, you know what phones are like. They change all the time. It's, it's very tricky getting your phone people in the store up to date all the time on it. If you have to wait for the latest announcement from Apple, write a course, pull the people out of the store to deliver the course, or even put the course online, it's too slow. And it's also not very effective. Going back to this business of spaced repetition and giving people micro-learning, what these guys have got is a platform that enables people to take a video of themselves. So I'm in Vodafone, I take a video of myself, I say, guys, I just had somebody come in to the store, uh, I was telling them, I was selling them a new Samsung 8, and I pointed out this about the phone, and that seemed to make a difference to them. Now, here's how you go about doing it. And he could talk about the sales technique, he could talk about the te technology, whatever. One and a half minute, two minute video goes up online. Nobody checks it, there's no, there's no control. It goes up into the territory, and the territory shares it. After running this for about one and a half years, Vodafone were able to look across the data for the stores that were using, or the territories that were using the platform against the stores that weren't using the platform. Taking out other variables, they were able to say that there was a 6% increase in the lifetime value of the customers in the territories that were using it. 6% might not sound like much, but how much are you paying for your phone? <laughs> yeah, I'm paying too much for mine, I know that. If, if they get 6%, that goes straight to the bottom line, virtually. That is a 6% increase in profit. It's a huge number for these guys. And they're able to say it because they've got the data. So Mike's thing is, he's done the sharing piece like Anchor. And they're sharing stuff, and people are doing their jobs better. So it's a performance focus like Jeff. It's a sharing thing like Anchor. But in addition, he's got the background of the data, because Vodafone are fantastic at tracking their data, that enables them to say, you know what, well, this is what they say about it, the head of retail, the guy who's in charge of selling everything at Vodafone says, it's transformative. We've changed the way we do business as a result of this. This case is about two years old. Since then, they've gone on and they've done even, they've got even more fantastic data, which I can't share with you right now about it, but what they've proved is that sharing affects the bottom line if you do it right. Finally, this business of showing value can be done on a nice platform. It can be done through sharing. It can be done by not being focused on being a fulfillment house, but on production. Talking about Jeff, Anchor, and Mike. But being focused on value is something in L&D that we all have to do, and ultimately it comes down to understanding the business. I want to share with you the case study that I've got in my head, I always carry with me, that is the most extraordinary case study of value that I've ever seen of, of anybody doing L&D. This is Matt DeFeo, Tektronic, in, Tektronic Industries. Matt was part of this organisation that his part sells power tools. Okay? Well, I mean, I, 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 I like power tools, but it's not very exciting, right? It's uh, a drill, maybe. Okay. Mike was part of an organization that wanted to grow. It wanted to grow its market share, actually, at a time when the, when the overall market was contracting. It wanted to do this in a way that didn't involve any more cost. Now... Actually, already, I'm using words that, for many people in learning development, just don't make any sense. So the first thing we've got to do in L&D is make sure we're understanding words like market share, contraction, and so on. He totally gets it. And what he does is he goes out and he looks at, where can I make a difference to the business? He's not waiting for somebody to phone him. Where can I make a difference to the business? And he works out that too many people bringing drills back for a warranty that they shouldn't be. Now, when you buy a drill, you have in it an iron battery, which is a, very ex a lithium iron battery. It's a very expensive thing. And if you come back with, and you say, this drill's not working, can I, can I just exchange it back, please? And you get your money back, then that's okay, but it's not okay if you shouldn't do it. Sometimes the warranty is good, sometimes the warranty is not valid. About 4% of the drills were being returned. Mike made a list. He talked to the managers. What are the 10 most common reasons that drills get returned when they shouldn't be under the warranty? 
And some of these were pretty extraordinary. So sometimes the drill comes back, it has no battery in it. The battery is the most expensive bit. It hasn't got the battery, it's not fulfilling the warranty, you can't exchange it. Sometimes the drill comes back, it doesn't have the battery in it, but it doesn't feel light because they put a brick in it instead to try to fool you. Okay? Guess what? You've got to check it. Right? Very simple. This is not sophisticated stuff. He made up this list of 10 things. He made a very, very simple e-learning course. Very simple course that went out to people. It was not a course so much as a performance aid. These are the things to check for. Managers, check your people are checking for it. And he worked with the managers to make it work. What was the impact on Tektronix? The impact on Tektronix was it went from a 4% return rate to a 1.8% return rate. They saved the business $35 million by drawing up a list of 10 things. It's just absolutely mad. You draw up a list of the 10 most common reasons, you tell people about it, and you save the organization $35 million. And it was part of the business's growth that year. They spent that money on other things. The company did grow 10% as the rest of the, business was contra rest of the market was contracting. So to come back to these four people, Jeff shifted to performance. He was business savvy. Anchor decided that sharing was good and managed to change within the organization. Mike Booth managed to do sharing and prove value. And Matt was totally able to prove value. And he was utterly focused on the business. For me, this is a very traditional story. But all of this is about us being agents of change and driving the change ourselves rather than being the guys on the end of the phone taking the order, like Deliveroo. I see you've got Deliveroo now in Kuala Lumpur, the guys cycling around and delivering pizza and what have you. We're not Deliveroo, right? We're a bit, nothing more Deliveroo, but we are bigger than that. We are professionals helping our organizations do better. Could we open the back door? Back door, was there only door? Thank you. Just want to get some air coming through. That's good. I've been talking for enough now, and I'm going to start moving some things over to you. We talked about user-generated content, didn't we, when we were talking about this? I just want to, I'm going to quickly describe to you some things. I'm going to ask you to do some stuff together. Because I want to shift now to you taking some of what we've talked about today back to the workplace. So... We're going to move to L&D in practice. I'm going to start, well, there are three things. We might not cover all of these. Three things to look at. One of them is content, one of them is tools, and one of them is our strategy, what we're doing. On the content side, I want to start by looking at what I call the, the pyramid of content. It used to be, when I started in L&D, that life was very simple. Most of what we did was we wrote courses. And when I was teaching Excel back in the early 90s, you would write a course in Excel, you would deliver a course in Excel. There was some stuff that was available. Maybe you could get a book on it. And you might, have, you might get somebody else in to write a course for you sometimes. But basically, you created courses yourselves. I think things are a bit different now. There's a lot more stuff out there. And I want to share something with you. And then I'm going to ask you to work out in your own organization how it fits together. We still have external stuff. We still have stuff we do ourselves. There's still stuff available out there. But in the middle, there's a whole lot of stuff that we could be using if we put our mind to it. I mean, you know about Skillsoft. You know about big libraries of content. They are out there. And I'm amazed that there are still people in organizations writing course in Excel. You, it's either going to be free on YouTube or it's going to be available on your library that you've got an, an, an enterprise license for. It, it, it's not necessary. But in addition, you've got two other forms of content which I think are incredibly valuable. One is curated content sets, which is when somebody comes and says, you know what, for your needs in your organization, you can pull together stuff from the internet, from your enterprise licenses, and We've got some pathways we'll create for different people in your organization. Now, this is a relatively new thing. You've got organizations like Degreed, like Open Sesame, and like Skillsoft who are doing this in a consultative basis for the organizations. 
and you've got UGC, user-generated content. So does anybody in this room do anything with user-generated content at all? No? Do you think you've got some in your organization? I mean, when we're talking about um, Mike Booth at Vodafone and these guys making their videos, that is all user-generated content they're doing. That's, making, that's increasing the lifetime value of their people by 6%. That's gone straight to the bottom line of the organization. So it's not, it's not trivial. All right. I'm going to ask you guys, because I've done enough talking for a while, to take this bit of paper. Hold on, hold on. OK. One thing, no, thank you. But you know this, right? If you're talking to a bunch of people, the last thing you want to do is hand out the bit of paper. The first thing you've got to do is explain what you're going to do with it. So <clears throat> there's my pyramid, right? I've got two columns at the top, time and cost and impact. I would just like you to think about this. You can talk about it yourself, chat about it, and just write down how much time or cost, however you want to do it, those things are in your organization, and what do you think the impact is. It might be you don't know, and that's fine. Maybe you say, I don't know how much user-generated content we've got. It might be you've got zero. But I, what I want to do is have a focus on where are we putting our effort and what value are we getting out of it, okay? And it's fine to put zero or I don't know on any of it, okay? And if you want to do it in conversation with somebody else, that's fine too. Han, can we deliver these to the tables, please? Okay. So it's one per person if, if, if possible. Ah, you've got it all sorted out. Okay. Look at that. Yes, yes, and nothing more. Okay. So have a look at it, and it might be, it might be that the answer is, I don't know, I don't know. But I just, I just, what I want to do is have everybody thinking, where are we putting our effort, which is here, just right down here, you know, is it, I'm, I'm putting most of my time here, most of my cost here, and what value am I getting out of it? And it might be that you can't do it, and that's fine, but we need to absolutely be thinking about this. Does it make sense what the question is, guys? Does it make sense? What, is my question clear or not? No. Okay, let me explain. Okay, so what we've got here is the different types of content that I think exist in an organization. And it might be you're, doing, you're creating all the courses internally. Yeah? It might be that all your effort and all your time goes in that. So just write everything or 100% or five days there. It might be you, it's spread out. It might be that you're you think actually a lot of people are using this stuff here uh, and you're helping them with that, the, helping them get to the internet and do stuff. Okay, so you can write here, most of my time is spent here. I'm also interested to know though what the impact is. It might be that you're helping people get to the internet but on reflection, they're not getting much value out of it. So what I'm trying to do is really use this as a way of thinking about where am I putting my effort? What value am I getting from it? Okay, and you can use whatever format, whatever metrics you want, okay? And I'm not going to ask anybody to share this with the rest of the group, because this is your information about your organization, so don't feel bad about it. It's a, it's a way to think about it more than something else. Hmm? I'll, I'll, I'll tell everybody, because I want to be clear about that. Guys, when I, by the way, when I say externally commissioned, I mean you've got somebody else to do it for you, okay? So you, 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 here, you're writing a course yourself, here, you've got somebody else to write a course for you and maybe deliver it for you as well. Okay? I hope that was, wasn't clear. And I'm not going to ask anybody to tell the rest of the room about this at all, right? This is just for you to think about it. What I've tried to do with this is to, is to suggest a is to suggest a way of thinking about the world. 
so that, I'm just going to crack, crack through some more of these. Um, so with this, what I've tried to do is suggest a way of thinking about the world. It's not something you can probably answer now. It's much more something to take away and say, you know what, I, I tend to think mostly that about creating courses ourselves. I'm going to think about this in a different way. I'm going to work out time or cost, but effort, and I'm going to work out impact. And there are lots of ways of measuring impact. It doesn't have to be a, a hard ROI study. There are lots of ways of doing it. Okay. How many, I just want to quickly check something. How many people in the room use entirely digital stuff for getting people to do learning? Anybody? Entirely digital? But it's blended, but... Yeah? Okay, so, oh, right, okay. So some bits might be entirely online, but overall there is, there is some face-to-face -face stuff as well. No? No? Okay. 100% online. Oh, good. Is anybody doing stuff entirely face-to-face? Or not just face to face, but with physical things like books. No, I, I would. I'd be amazed if anybody was. All right. Just wanted. To, just well, you could. I, I was actually. I had this conversation with somebody who who deals with legal practice in the UK, and they do everything face to face, and with books, and they're very happy, uh, because the field they work in, things haven't changed very much, and so they could, they're comfortable doing that. It's, I, I, was, I was pretty, pretty surprised. Um, what I'd like to do is, is have a quick, now do something which is similar but slightly different, have a conversation between people on tables about the tools you're using, and then it's another tool for you to, to look at now and then to take away. So here, very often in the past when we talk about e-learning or digital learning, we, we tend to think you're either doing it traditionally or you do it digitally. I think it's more complicated than that. I think that there are two dimensions to it. I think you either do it interactively and non-interactively, or you do it electronically or non-electronically. So there's a bit more to it. Uh, so if you think about it, you've got examples like a book, obviously, is not very interactive, um, and it's non-electronic. A lot of traditional e-learning, where you just hit the next button, is very non-interactive. But, of course, it's entirely electronic. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I haven't done my other two quadrants. But it's a very good question. Interactive online training. Right, so if I'm doing an online course, you can guess. I'm asking lots of questions. We're going backwards and forwards. It's interactive. It's electronic. And a classroom should be interactive. And it sh Sorry. Classroom should be interactive and not electronic. All right. So what about a blend? What are you saying? A blended? What is a blended classroom? Yeah. So I would, it, it depends how you're doing it. So a blended classroom could be like that. It could be, it's because it, it's both of those, but it's, a, it, but it's interactive. Or it could be like that. So you're doing stuff offline that is with books, and you're doing stuff in the classroom, which is face to face. It's still blended, but there's nothing electronic involved. It's still a blended approach. Okay. Or it could be like that. You're doing a traditionally learning course before you come in, then you do the course from the course, that's very interactive, and you go back to doing push stuff. So, depends. I'm going to ask you to... No, no, no. <laughs> you had a look of horror on your face there for a second. <laughs> What's he going to ask? Why does he keep picking on me? <laughs> I've had this conversation with lots of people in the past, and... When I ask them to do this, I ask them to draw on here what they've got. You, oops, you get all sorts of stuff on there. What are they doing? So books and manuals down here, quick reference cards, flash demos, open university courses, one-to-one -one sessions, floor walking, articulate, and so on. Loads of stuff on there. 
we tend to talk about things in small buckets. It's a course, it's a book, something. But actually, most people are doing an awful lot of stuff. What I'd like you to do now is to start sharing with other people on your table, what are you doing? And just, just firstly, sketch out on your own bit of paper. So I'm going to give you a bit of paper. Just, and just write on it. You, you're going to get one. You don't have to draw the axes. You're going to get one. How good is that? You're going to write on it what you're doing and then have a conversation with other people on the table and we're going to find that other people are doing stuff that's really interesting and we can learn from them. So I'm going to need some help to get these distributed. Can you? Uh, no, one each, I've decided. We, ha we have enough. If we don't have enough, people are going to have to draw one themselves. <laughs> after I made that big fuss. Do you think we don't have enough? Oh, let's see. So you're, you, may not have, you may not have as many things as this to write down, but try to write down as many things as you're doing internally as you can on here. And these are just examples. You're not sure? Are you, are you using books at all? Classroom? Okay, so first thing you do is write down there. You've got, a class, you've got some classroom stuff. It's, it's non-electronic, but is it, is it interactive? Do people interact in the classroom? Yes, okay. So it should be there, yeah. It's on... Yeah. Oh, it's a good one. It's a good one. That's, no, it's a fair question. It's a fair question. I, I, I'm, I'm still calling that non-electronics. What's mostly happening in a classroom is you're talking together. You could do it without the laptop, couldn't you? In which case, it's it's a class. It's a, the good old days of having overhead projectors. Yeah, or whatever. So I, ILT on there means classroom. It means instructor-led training. That's what it sounds like. So I'd, I'd have that there. You're not sure? Is that it? Yep. What have we got? We have four areas. Mm -hmm. uh, we have classroom trainings, we have train the trainer uh -huh. trainings. Um, here it's some sort of books. Um, so after they've gone through the train trainer, mm -hmm. they develop their own course. We have huh. the panels, we have the head slides, we have the manuals. And uh, we have an e platform, we have uh, e onboarding, which is uh, electri electronic mm -hmm. and interactive. Uh, we build course on top of this. Uh, Using it's ice very cream. cool. Yeah. Using what, sorry? Ice cream. It's, okay. it's an altering tool. Right. Yeah. So we use ice cream to, to 
make this forest into an electronic and interactive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also introduce Coursera courses to our employees. Uh -huh. um, How is that going, by the way? We are we let it free flow because right. uh, learning is a new culture in, in our organization, so we don't force it. Well, that's great. And are they using them? Uh, some of them, yes, they did. Response, uh, they asked me, hey, how, how am I going to take this course? It's new to me. Right. So there are responses like that. Okay, yeah. well, that's good. I, and I'm surprised it's from a senior guy. Huh. Yeah. Surprised why? Because I think electronics are more engaged with. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I didn't thought of, okay, maybe it's a course related to finance. Yeah. And, and he is, uh, is basically a GM. Right. And he said, he's almost retirement age. Right. But so so there's one day that he came to me and said, hey, Sonny, what, what is this? I want to learn this. Cool. Yeah, you can. Mm -hmm. I'll teach you later. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Good. Yeah. Are you guys all working together? No? Yeah. You too? And so are you are your two the same? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. And he, what I'm going to ask you next is, are you, is it static this? Is this what you're doing and it's not going to change? Or are you moving your emphasis from one area to another area? So it ha just tell me. Uh, uh, well, well, I joined this organization one year ago uh -huh. and basically has nothing at all. Uh -huh. So it's all new? Yeah. Wow. So it's all new. <laughs> Okay, that's very impressive. That's good. <laughs> How about you guys? You are you moving? Are you changing it? Yeah, we are moving uh, in a way because uh, we have been uh, online for the past five years yeah. in a way. So we are moving to the next level. For example, gamification and all that. So right. We try to increase the user adoption rate because it's currently it's being forced. It's kind right. Of pushed right. Right. So we we want to have the culture of uh, self-based learning. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So that's. One of the reasons introducing uh, gamification right. and all that, and uh, also we're looking into uh, uh, webinars and all that. Okay. So our, the most challenging part is the platforms. So yeah. Also another area where he was mentioning just now security. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, all right. We're that's exploring, it. That's we're exploring. We're also I, looking at the cloud-based elements. There's so many LMSs out there. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask the question to everybody in a minute, what, what's static and what's moving? Because it'd be very interesting to see it. OK. OK, guys. So uh, the, the, purpose of, the purpose of this is to, the purpose of this is to, is to get an idea of what the landscape is in your organization, and also then to think about, it, are you happy with where it is, and do you want it to change? So when I have this conversation with people, I, I say, is this a static picture or is it moving? And usually when I talk to people, uh, I get them to draw an arrow of what's happening. And ILT stands for instructor-led training. And usually what happens is people say, well, we're moving out of ILT into other areas. A lot of, a lot, I see a lot of this, which is moving from classroom instructor-led training to online webinars and so on and out of ILT into um, it get, getting stuff from people into other formats, so podcasts, videos, and so on, which is a, not interactive, but it's trying to capture people's knowledge and put it in a place where it can be pulled down. So does it, I mean, I, I, we've just been talking on this table here. Definitely there's a movement in what's happening. Looking at what you've drawn in front of you, do you think you've got the right solution in place, or are you going to be making changes? And if so, what changes will you be making? Any changes? Business as usual. You're happy. You've got it 100% perfect. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So if, if I had to say to you, what's the, you're, we're talking here about looking at cloud-based LMS. Is anybody else doing any particular initiative they're trying to change in their organization? Trying to bring live webinars? So you're doing this, probably. Yeah. And why? Right. Without talking about it now, I think a lot of, a lot of people are making the move from ILT, from instructor-led training into, into webinars, 
I have actually written a book on, on webinars and I've done, been doing them for about 10 years. I'm very happy to have a conversation over lunch if you just want to explore tips for making it successful and not. Um, are there, is there any other changes that anybody's making? On this table here, is anybody, are you making a change anywhere? Are you happy with your, your, your media at the moment or are you making a shift to something else? It's all perfect. It's great. <laughs> great. Yeah. It's an app, so it's electronic. Sorry? It's, an, it's electronic. <laughs> well, is it, is it, now what sort of app is it? Does it involve sharing things with other people? Yeah, or do you pull down information? It's a combination. Right. So you've got quizzes, pre learning, yep. quizzes, videos, um, you know, and it's got the analytics that goes through. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's them having to learn how to adopt this and get away from the comfort zones of the pattern. I completely agree. What what is the comfort zone that they're in? So, it, it, so one is in the past learning and development people they put stuff out and let's say you know we've built it everyone should come. Yep. But now when you start getting to the mobile people people need to change their learning habits. And that is a major challenge for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a, a big change that organisations, from our experience, are facing. It's the human factor that drives them. So there's the technology, which is one piece, yep. but there is the human part. And there's the human part which goes at two levels. It's that learning and development level, learning how to manage this mm -hmm. and market it. Yes, yes. And then it's getting the people to use it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how other people feel about that, but it's, it's, I think it's a very good description of what where we are at learning and development at the moment, which is that we're, we're shifting from where it used to be. So when I started in this field, it, was, it, was, it wasn't complicated. You wrote courses, you delivered courses, people came to the classroom, they sat and they did the course, and you did your job. And it was all very well defined. And now we're in this position whereby we are changing what we do, we're using different tools, we are far less focused, ideally, on courses and and also on this particular model. The model is that learning is the same as chopping up bits of information and giving it to people, whether you do it in the classroom or whether you do it online. Now, that's not learning. That's chopping up things and giving it to people. Learning is when people absorb stuff and they put it to work usefully for themselves, which can happen in a range of ways. So we have to unlearn what we're doing and learn it in a new way, and they have to learn that actually the load is on them too. You can't just sit up, and turn up and listen. And when I had that picture of the classroom, that was what I was alluding to. The fact that we have, and it's not, it, this is worldwide. Everywhere there is this problem that people think learning means I turn up, I sit down, I listen. Either physically or I do it on a, a course online. But it's not anymore. So this, this is about, well, how do we engage with people technically? But how do we engage with people in terms of change management is a much bigger issue. Okay? We're about to break for lunch. We've got about one minute left. And I can't actually handle the whole change management for an organization in one minute. But if you want a book on it, there's this great book called Learning Technologies in the Workplace by Don Taylor. That's his name. <laughs> and um, I tell you what, the last word in the book is, the last word in the book is people. Because you can do all the technology you want, but ultimately, if you can't fix it with the people, it's not going to happen. So thank you for raising the point, George. Good. In fact, that's probably quite a good point for me to leap forward to the end of the presentation. And I'm just going to press the button again. Oh, God. 
this, this is why I usually use my own laptop. Uh, I'm just going to quickly, I want to just do one rallying cry to end on, and then we're going to wrap up. There's a lot of stuff we could talk about with strategy, but it's time for lunch. But I want to just end with what I think is, is uh, for me, the most important thing about learning and development. Learning and development used to be about, um, well, what I was saying. We were, we, were, we were a fulfillment house. We chopped bits of information up and we gave it to people, but it's much more than that. And I think in order to understand, to George's point, how do we change what we do so that we are more strategic, we have to understand our role. So what is our role? I've got a picture of St Paul's Cathedral here for a reason. You, you know this is St Paul's Cathedral in, in London, right? And you know I'm from London. And there's a story about this which you've probably heard. It might be in this context or a different context. Uh, the original wooden St Paul's Cathedral burnt down in the fire of London and it was being rebuilt. And Sir Christopher Wren was walking through the building and he sees three masons working away on some stone. And he goes to the first one and he says, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm, uh, I'm making a gargoyle or a column. Okay, so that's, he's doing his job, he's making something. He says to the next guy, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm making some money for my family. And well, that's him. Fine. He goes to the last guy and the last guy is carving, he doesn't look up. Christopher Wren says, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a cathedral. So he sees that bit, and he understands how it fits into the whole. And we sometimes think about, oh, I, I'm a designer, or I work with people. We describe our jobs in certain ways. But for me, what we do is that last bit. I'm building a cathedral. What's the big role that we do? And there is a role. It's the most important thing. When I left university, I didn't go and become a banker. Everybody else in 1987 left university and went and became bankers. They're all fabulously rich now, of course, and very wealthy. But I'm very happy doing what I'm doing. I decided to go into training. And I think it's not what we do that's important. It's not whether we make a stone this or this or that or the other. It's what we make possible, what we make possible. I think it's far more important than what those guys working in the banks are doing. Although, of course, financial institutions are very important. <laughs> what are we doing? What do we make possible? We enable individuals and organisations to fill their potential. That's what we do. Somebody comes in the classroom, somebody learns something, they go away doing something better. We do our job right with the organisation. The organisation is able to do its job better. I'm not as rich as my colleagues who left university and worked in banks in 1987. But I'm very happy to be fulfilling this role. Oh, thank you very much. I'm going to jump to the end, and I'm going to ask you, oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff here we could have talked about. Let's just quickly recap. I went to a funny school. I go to, I go to the museum every year with my daughter. We have to adapt. There's a whole bunch of stuff to have to think about with user-generated content and pyramids. That's what I talked about, wasn't it? And some other stuff as well. <laughs> if it's not clear, that's me. I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. And this is the end of a presentation, but the beginning of a conversation. It will continue over lunch, and it will continue elsewhere, I hope, electronically. And by all means, feel free to have a look at that book, Learning Technologies in the Workplace. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. <laughs>